whatever happened to me in 2014 happened mm. it was devastating mm. that's my best way of describing yeah, it yeah i mean that stuff is i lost my career mm. i lost my business mm. i lost my house even a few years after all this had happened mm. he was still reeling the effects of it yeah. right yeah he was running his clinical practice and he got a client who wanted to give up smoking so dr erickson got him in did hypnotherapy with him two hour session and at the end of the session dr erickson says to him on your way out just pay my secretary you haven't done anything to yeah. me i've just sat here for two hours i don't even know where the time's gone what have you done and i still feel like having a cigarette mm. so doctor said that's fine have a cigarette and he called back this spoke to that secretary and he says i just wanted to tell you that that was the most useless session that i ever did and i ever paid for it had no impact on me whatsoever but i decided to give up smoking yesterday <laughs> <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum, and thank you very much for having me here. My name is Shahid, Shahid Abu Yusra, and it's a pleasure to be invited by my good friend Khurram. I say good friend, but we don't meet that often, we should correct that inshallah. Uh, to come and, and spend some time with him and, and have a chat and, and I hope that uh, inshallah we'll all benefit from this, myself included. Um, a little bit about what I do, I'm an NLP trainer, I'm an ex-civil servant actually, started off at the age of 16, no formal qualifications and worked my way up to being a senior civil, a civil servant, a senior inspector of taxes. Um, I've uh, then gave up that career because I wasn't getting very far off, having got to the position I got to and started my own business. Um, I'm an NLP trainer, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which is all about how the brain works and how to model excellence and thereby achieve it as well. But in that journey of NLP, I've come across lots of people who I've learned lots from and hopefully helped a lot of people as well. And one of my uh, best, uh, one of my best achievements in this really it has been helping those people who other people, other specialists have written off and said that there's no hope for you. And those people now, alhamdulillah, they're on a different trajectory of life, doing what they like, achieving well, mashallah, um, and, and going down the road that they want, they, they want to go down. I met Khurram uh, a few years ago when he was in London and I was in London. And uh, the, 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 the meeting, I think, was quite spontaneous. And very soon afterwards, Khurram started writing his book. And uh, he was asking, uh, you know, we're, we're but somebody would uh, review the book for him, and I put my hand up and said, yep, I'll review it. And therefore, I was one of the first people to actually have access to that book, Billion Dollar Muslim, right here over my left shoulder. Get it if you can, well worth it. And I know that uh, there have been revisions since I reviewed it. I haven't looked at the latest version, but alhamdulillah, it, it's a really good book. It's one that we need to understand as an ummah if we are to make continuous prog progress towards you know being sustainable for ourselves inshallah and for helping the, the, the dunya and the ummah and continuing from that mashallah umar has made great strides and here i'm on his podcast today the billion dollar muslim podcast i really want to understand um because nlp i think a lot of people know about nlp mm. now generally as in the terms gotten out there mm. but you just mentioned the islamic aspect of nlp and you're saying <clears throat> you know you said in the bio that you um People are coming to you and it's the ones that nobody else can help. D tell me a little bit more about who are these people that nobody else can help. So give me some examples of those and then tell me about sure. what is the Islamic aspect that, that you're referring to and why is that helping or how is that helping? Sure. Let me just take a step back first. Um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Uh, and, and you mentioned just there that you know people know what NLP is. I'm actually running some courses right now, advertising courses right now. And I have a message this morning. What is NLP? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yes, a lot of people do know about it, but it gets confused with another NLP called natural language processing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's a little bit of a distinction. Which is, because that's becoming quite popular because that's it's right. GPT now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's yeah. right. So, so the NLP that I do, Neuro Linguistic Programming, uh, is something that I got into purely by accident about <coughs> nearly 25, 30 years ago. Okay. I was in the um, HMRC then. And we went for a training course. Um, I'd just been promoted to a technical worker. And so we went for a training course on, on a technical aspect, a really, really boring technical aspect, you know, all to do with figures and this, that, and the other. And it was a residential course. It was a five-day course. And before we went, we'd been told, you're going to get bored. You know, there was, there, was, there was about eight or nine of us from different parts of the revenue all on the same course. 
And we went there. And at the end of the five days, Khurram, we were all enthused. We were all raring to go. And so I went to the trainer. And I, I can't remember his name. I've been trying to remember it for ages. And I went to him and I said, just want to understand, what is it that you did that we were all warned off about this, that it's going to be really boring, really awful, you know, but we've really enjoyed it and we're all really enthusiastic. And he said, have you ever heard of neuro-linguistic programming? I said, no. He said, go look it up. And that's all he said. So he planted that seed. Mm -hmm. So when I had the opportunity, I, I looked up neuro-linguistic programming. And in those days, to do a course was £20,000. Of course, Ooh. I didn't have that money then. But I just kept in touch. I kept on you know, understanding it, you know, becoming aware of it. And when I finished my career in the HMRC, it then gave me an opportunity to pursue NLP. And when I looked at it, I thought, yeah, I want to do this. It was becoming more popular and becoming more affordable as well. So I did my, uh, I did my training, got my practitioner, and then I did my master practitioner virtually back to back. Okay. And having done that, um, when I was sitting back reviewing now, now I've done it, what do I do now? Uh, and because the whole drive of NLP was that, you know, you work with clients. Mm. I didn't have any clients, you know, mm. I didn't really know. They don't really tell you how to run an NLP mm. business. Mm -hmm. They just teach you NLP. So I started reviewing my material. And, and, and as I reviewed my material, I have a little bit of background in the dean. I'm not a scholar by any stretch of the imagination. I've not been to any seminary or not been to any university to study the dean. But I have had the very good fortune of spending a lot of time with scholars. Mm. Uh, that's partly because of my upbringing. My, my grandfather was very religious. He was the one who was responsible for my upbringing because my father wasn't in the country at that time. Um, and so I've had this connection with scholars. And, and alhamdulillah, the way that my grandfather brought me up, we're not limited to looking at just one school of thought. Mm. So we considered all scholars, you know, from all, if, mm. if they were a scholar, we went and listened to them. And if they made sense, alhamdulillah, we adopted it. If they didn't make sense, we yeah. wouldn't reject it because they're scholars mm. and we're not. But mm. it's something that you take on board. And so I, I, look, I started looking at NLP and the more I looked at it, the more it resonated with my faith, with mm. my fitra. Okay. In what way? Uh, in, in, in the ways that, you know, it was very simple. It was very straightforward. It made a lot of sense. It okay. was logical. Mm. You know, it wasn't airy-fairy as, as many people sometimes think that NLP is very airy-fairy. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't that. So, okay. so as just an example... Um, one of the things that we are told when you do salah is to, your, your best salah is that salah in which you achieve khushu. Mm. What is khushu? Khushu is a total connection with Allah in that moment. Mm. And the hadith says that if you can't imagine that, you know, Allah is looking at you, just imagine that you are in front of Allah. Mm. So make that connection to that level. And there's a, there's a process in NLP called anchoring. Very, very simple process. It takes about five minutes to do. And when I anchored myself, having had that thought, when I anchored myself for my salah, I actually achieved my best salah. Oh, wow. My best salah. I was just so focused. And then I repeated it when I had the opportunity to go for Umrah, and I repeated it in Makkah and Medina. And, you know, my salah, may Allah accept it. It was next level. Mm. Next level. And then I started experimenting with other things. Mm. And the same way, the, the more I thought about NLP from a religious perspective, the more it made sense to me. So I then started looking at NLP that, you know, I'm going to make a career out of this. I want to teach this, mm. but I just want to teach the NLP that everybody else teaches. Mm. So I then looked at the whole NLP curriculum mm. and I identified where the Quran and the Sunnah was relevant. Not right. that it's ever irrelevant, no, but in the context, in of, the the NLP, context of the NLP, you know, where was relevant and what references I could give yeah. uh, and what, what hadith I could share, what Quranic ayats I could share. Mm. And so then I, start, I delivered my first ever course um, from an Islamic point of view um, back in 2008. Okay. And by the grace of Allah, it was a massive hit. And that kind of gave me my Oh, direction. you delivered the course? I delivered the course. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. So th this course, because I've, I've met a lot of your students. Yeah. Um, and I, I know that you created quite a few superstars. Alhamdulillah. You know, and uh, you'd been teaching people and then the, obviously they went on to do yes, other things. Yes. So yeah, a lot of superstars are actually related to you. That people don't realize this, do by, they? By the grace of Allah. Yeah. By the grace of Allah. It's, I, like, I, it's like Bruce Lee. People remember Bruce Lee. But they don't remember the guy that trained him. Yeah, Master Yip. <laughs> master Yip. And now yeah. they're starting to know him. It's like you're like the Master Yip of the NLP. <laughs> well, uh, all, all credit is due to Allah. Yeah. All credit is for Allah, only the mistakes are mine. But yes, I, so I reviewed it and I delivered and I and I delivered developed that course, mm. you know, from that perspective. Okay. And and that kind of fashioned my journey into NLP mm. because I could have just gone out there and I could have just started delivering NLP to everybody and anybody. And for me that would not have been wouldn't have given the satisfaction it gives me. Okay. And now when people come to my course, 
and by the way, both Muslims and non-Muslims, mm. I delivered the same course. So okay. I delivered the, the Islamic version. Oh, really? Whether it's the Muslims or the non-Muslims, but majority of my students How are How do Muslims. they respond, the non-Muslims? And this is just what I was going to say, okay. that when the non-Muslims do it, not only does the NLP make sense to them, but alhamdulillah, it's a source of dawah. Yeah. So it's interesting that you say this because I've been, uh, so you, I, you probably, I know you follow my Instagram and stuff, you know, I, I put stories up and you know, people always said to me, you seem, if people only know me from social media, they always say you seem very unapproachable mm. because the kind of stories that I put up on my Insta, my Facebook, the posts I do, they're very much on the nose. Mm. But the whole point is for it to create a reaction. Yeah. And um, most of the people that are following me are obviously are Muslim. But um, about a week ago, this guy was messaging me and I just naturally assumed he was Muslim because we were having this conversation about riba mm. and stuff. Like well, not riba, but we were having a conversation about like the banking system and the legal system and all this. So I, because I assumed he was Muslim, I had, a, and he mentioned God, he mentioned the word God. Mm -hmm. So I assumed he was Muslim. Mm. I had a conversation with him the way that I would have a conversation with a Muslim. I said, oh, riba, this, 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 all this. And he goes, oh, excuse me, what, what, what is riba? Can you tell me what riba is? And I said, oh, it's this, it's usury. He goes, ah, yes, 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 yes. So uh, having that conversation with him as a Muslim mm -hmm. has actually been, was actually really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I think, uh, I don't know why we shy away from it. I shy away from it. Yeah, well, I don't know why we do that. But well, this, this is one of the things you see, uh, again, uh, you know, it's how every single thing you go through in life yeah. is actually there for a reason. Mm. And before I started NLP, um, in the late 1980s, I got involved in Dawa. And I got involved in Dawa at a very high level. That was not HT, was it? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you say Dawa, it's always HT. <laughs> no, it wasn't HT. I was actually one of the few people who was close to HT, but never actually okay. formally a member of HT. Okay, okay. And, and to this day, I have some fantastic people, fantastic friends who are HT. Yeah. And we are great friends. Yeah. We may have our disagreements, but mm. we're great friends. So I don't yeah. have a problem with that, yeah. alhamdulillah. And I hope they don't have a problem with me. Yeah. Um, um, so anyway, I got into Dawa, and, and this Dawa was... Was, was the comparative religion dawah. Okay. So talking to non-Muslims, talking to Christians, oh, Jews, okay. Hindus, whatever. Right. And I, you know, went in and I studied the Bible and I studied the Torah, I studied the Injil, you know, I, and I could debate just like famous scholars of dawah of, you know, used to do. So I could do that. So, so I had that insight. And so now when I deliver the course right. and I'm doing it from an Islamic perspective, mm. I could actually bring in that relevance. So mm. not only can I quote the Quran, but I can say actually the Bible says this as well. Mm. So for example, about you know being a good person and being you know doing your fitrah, there's a presupposition in NLP that everybody's doing the best they can. Yeah. You know, with the resources they have available, mm. right? So what are the resources? And your main resource is your mind. Mm. So what's your mindset like? Because mm. if your mindset isn't right, and you've got all of the physical resources, you won't do anything with them. Mm. You may temporarily, mm. but it's not sustainable. Mm. For it to be sustainable, your mind has to be right. Mm. And for your mind to be right, you have to be congruent. That's another NLP word. Mm. Congruent is that your inside and your outside is the same. And of course, as Muslims, who was the most congruent person who ever lived? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. He was out, he was externally what he was internally. And his wife, you know, our mother confirmed that when she was asked, mm. what's he like behind closed doors? And the she says, well, he's a walking Quran, mm. right? Mm. And so when I bring that out and I have a non-Muslim in the audience, that's dawah about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mm. And then I will say to them, by the way, did you know that another Prophet that I really respect, Jesus, mm. Isa Alayhi Isa mm. was also like that. Mm. And, and, and that's Musa why he was challenged, Islam, yeah. And Musa Islam. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great, you know, form. Mm. It's an opportunity for Dawah, alhamdulillah. But just talking about this being like what you are outdoors and indoors, mm. I was literally thinking about this yesterday mm -hmm. because, you know, this, this term obviously has become a lot more popular in the last few years, this term narcissism. Yeah. And the classic thing about the narcissist is that the narcissist can be very good outdoors or outside, but then as soon as they go behind the scenes, right. they're a completely different person. And they're so good at the acting. Yes. That actually, it's for, for the lay person or for the untrained eye, shall we say, the untrained person, it's very difficult for them to see that yeah. actually that this person is doing acting and it's this person here that's actually the most dangerous yeah. because they will present better behavior. So, say, if, say for argument's sake, say you're, you're not a narcissist, but let's say, let's say I was a narcissist and you weren't the narcissist. If we go into a social gathering, I might behave better than you, mm. even though I'm the worst person. Yeah. Because you're not acting, you're just being yourself. Exactly, exactly. And then I'm acting, but then behind closed doors, you're still the same as you were before. That's right. But I'm much worse behind closed doors. Yeah. 
That's the classic narcissist. Yeah, yeah. because you don't have to act anymore. Yeah. You come down to what you're next. And they get drained. And the other thing is yeah. they get drained. They don't yeah. like social gatherings because they get drained absolutely. by it because absolutely. they're having to act. Yeah, absolutely. And and so the, the, these are these are many of the things that we actually cover. And, and so your, your original question, if I may go back to that, was yeah. was to say, you know, who are these people yeah. that I've that I've helped yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that that you know other people have rejected? And 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 Khurum, very simply. There's nothing majorly wrong with them, right? right? And they've not been rejected by other counselors, therapists, or even doctors because they can't fix them. But it's just that the desire. It's just not working. Yeah, it's not working. And the yeah. desire within the person is not there. Right. And unless a person wants to be healed or treated, they can't be healed or treated. And You've they say, accept. don't they? A lot of these yeah. people say they want to heal, but they actually don't. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, how do you get through that? Right. So, so again, what, what you have to do is you have to go back. To what, to what is the fitra, what is the nature. Right. And the nature for every person is to be good. The nature of every person is to want better for themselves, to want better for their family. But you go through situations in life that actually cloud that view, cloud mm. that vision. Mm. And so my major role in any therapy that I do is actually to remove those curtains, to remove that cloud. The veils. To let them see the veils, to let them see themselves for who they really are. Mm. And, and seriously, when people actually get a glimpse of that that's what switches them on okay and once they're switched on because they want to live that potential that's right yeah. and once that's switched on then to do the work with them actually becomes easier and becomes a joy okay. you know um i i've had uh, i'll give you an example of of course without any names um we had a i was referred a client by a person who's a consultant psychiatrist dealing with this client you know this at hospital wasn't getting anywhere and he phoned me up. He's a personal friend. I've helped his his son with exams and whatever. So he said to him, by the way, I've got this client. Can you... I'm at a dead end. <laughs> can, you, can you help me? So I said, well, you know, what's the issue? And he said, I, I don't want to tell you the issue because I don't want this to be a medical thing for you. Mm. Um, but, you know, if you were to speak to them, could you help them? And it so transpired that this the client was actually a young 16-year-old girl. Okay. Right? She was, especially because of COVID, mm -hmm. Having been locked inside, she'd lost her motivation to go out. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to study. She mm. was bright, but she didn't want to study. Mm. She didn't want to mingle. She didn't mm. want to do anything. She had no interest whatsoever. Traumatized. She, yeah. And she just didn't want to get out of bed. She just didn't see the point in doing mm. anything. Mm. So when I, the, in my first conversation with her, I just said to her, how do you see yourself in five years from now? And her response was, well, just the way I am today. Mm. And I said, is that something that you want to be? And that was it. No, I don't want to be that because everybody I talked to her about will help you get better, and then you'll start doing that. You'll start mm. doing that. I didn't talk about doing anything. I just is that how you want to be? Is mm. that how you want to continue to be? Mm. And the fact that she realized that if she didn't do anything to help herself, she was not going to improve, and things may even get worse. You know, she she switched on. Right. And then we had a few sessions, and you again, the by difference. the grace of Allah, three months down the line. She was back at college. Mashallah. She was back going outside. She passed her GCSEs. Mashallah. And I now understand she's at college. Wow. You know, doing her A-levels. It didn't take much. So it didn't take much. It was just the questioning. Yeah. It was just how you approach. And you know, this is why in the Quran, and again, this is where I link NLP to the Quran. The Quran has been a great source of strength for me. Because when I'm dealing with people like that, and you read the Quran, and the Quran constantly is asking you questions. But the type of questions it's asking you are not dead-end questions. Yeah. They're questions like, Will the thinkers not reflect? Mm. Will and they, they not they, ponder? And they merit an authentic response as well. Yeah, absolutely. You can't. You can. You if you that the question that the, the, that Allah asks you in the Quran, if you were to lie to yourself in answering that question, you would know. First of all, you know you're lying exactly, to yourself. Exactly. Exactly. And you know you're doing yourself a disservice by yeah, answering that. Yeah. 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 So, so Alhamdulillah. So, so it's all down to questioning then. Down to questioning. Down to questioning. I, I put something out about China the other day. It was just purely economic observation about China, right? It's just purely economic, objective observation. Mm. And somebody went, okay, so do you support China now? And I went, how have you gone from this economic <laughs> observation to me supporting China? And then they went, uh, okay, then never mind. Yeah. But normally what would happen now is I would defend my sure, point. Sure. But by asking the question, yeah. actually brought out their... Yeah. They, they can see the fallacy in their own thinking. Yeah. And then I don't have to point it out. They don't have to make them feel bad. Yeah. I don't have to be the one to make them feel that way. And, and that, in a nutshell is what we should aspire to. Okay. Well, what, how can we do that to ourselves? Okay. How can we ask our own selves that question? Because yeah. that's hard to do. Yeah. So, 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 so one of the things of NLP, around NLP, is to be comfortable in your own skin. Okay. To be comfortable with who you are. Right. Right. 
and to value yourself, but also to believe in yourself to the extent that you can put things out there. And when people come back to you, not to take it personally. Yeah. That's the key thing. Okay. When you start taking some somebody else's response personally, that's when it clouds your judgment mm-hmm. and it leads you down the, but how do down, you get down the argumentative route. Because you see, Zuhair said the same yeah. thing. Zuhair said the same thing. It's just disbanded. And I asked him the same question. Yeah. There's not, that stuff's not easy to do. And somebody's really grating at you. It's not yeah. easy. It's not easy at all. And that's where your internal resilience comes in. Okay. Right? And the internal resilience is built how? Number one, as always, ask Allah for help. Okay. Allah is the, you know, he's ni'mal wakil. Okay. He's the best. So advisor, in that moment, you ask Allah for help. Ask Allah for help. You ask Allah for help and then you go back in your mind. And this is where the linguistic part of neurolinguistic program comes in. What has happened to you previously that's made you react in a certain way and you decided I don't want to act that way again. Mm. So now's the time for you to trigger that mm. change. Okay. And of course, that change will only happen if you've considered it and if you've practiced it. So that's why it's important to sit with somebody to maybe have therapy or to do read some books or to watch some videos which allow you to develop a new behavior that you can use instead. Okay. And once you get used to doing this, and it's, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's seed after seed after seed, and suddenly then the seed flowers. Okay. So I want to take exactly the example you gave, Khurram, and I want to give you a counter example. Shall, shall I give you a little bit more elaboration on it first? Go on. So I, I found myself like, um, if if I'm arguing with somebody that's, if certain people who are, are, are like elders, if they, they get into an argument with you, I've noticed, I've only noticed this recently, I've noticed that I've, when I argue back with them, I argue as if my father is speaking or my mother is speaking. And I'm like, why am I doing that? Mm. That means I don't have my own voice in this. Yeah. And that's actually quite futile. Yeah, absolutely. We'll come back to that. Okay, right? all right, fine. So Dr. Milton Erickson, right, the world's most famous hypnotherapist. Okay. And he's, he's, he's also known as the founder of hypnosis, okay. right, as the father of hypnosis. He was running his clinical practice and he got a client who wanted to give up smoking. So Dr. Erickson got him in, did hypnotherapy with him, two-hour session. And at the end of the session, Dr. Erickson says to him, on your way out, just pay my secretary. Okay. And the guy says, pay her for what? You haven't done anything. (laughs) You haven't done anything to me. I've just sat here for two hours. I don't even know where the time's gone. What have you done? And I still feel like having a cigarette. Mm. So Dr. said, that's fine. Have a cigarette. But on your way out, pay the secretary. And by the way, call me in two weeks' time to let me know how it went. Right. So the guy goes outside, has a go at the secretary, pays the money but says it's a complete waste of time. I'm never going to call you again. I'm going to tell everybody about it and went off. He didn't call back two weeks later. He called back a month later and he called back and he spoke to that secretary and he says, I just wanted to tell you that that was the most useless session that I ever did and I ever paid for. It had no impact on me whatsoever, but I decided to give up smoking yesterday. <laughs> I know a very similar, I know a very similar situation to yeah. this. There's a lady, she goes in and she had, she had an allergy to wheat. Um, gluten allergy she went in this guy this guy looked at her fingers or something just looked at her fingers they spoke for six minutes Mm -hmm. she goes oh your wheat allergy is gone she was really annoyed she walked away and uh, apparently a month later she was like well I still have the wheat allergy because the doctor says I still have one but I just felt like eating bread and I've been eating it and I've I've actually been okay (laughs) exactly six minutes six minutes that's right that's right Dr. Erickson was you know two hours but that was you know smoking is deeper Mm. Uh, but yeah so it can be done and it's actually you know, it's, that, it's planting that seed is what's but important. What do, what do you think about something like Tony? Because when you say NLP, yeah. you know, the, the one name that always comes up is Tony, Tony Robbins. Robbins yeah. And I know a lot of people have been to his, what I now call concerts, because it's like a concert <laughs> now, isn't it? Yeah. And they haven't benefited a lot of yeah. those, have they? Yeah. So what do you say to somebody? So, so I, I, I came across Tony Robbins in my early days of NLP, okay. uh, before I'd actually done any courses. Okay. And I found, I read a couple of his books. I found mm. them very motivational mm. because books is completely different to being with him mm. live. Mm. Being with him live, as you say, it's it's a it's a sugar rush. Yeah, you know, he just yeah. he has the music going, he has this yeah. going, it's he's just a concert. Speaking, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> like a concert. Yeah. So I found his books very motivational. And I don't find him that motivation on listening to him. Okay. Okay. But he's but, been very good in interviews as but, well. Yeah, he Somebody's has been. Interviewing he has, him. He, says he very good definitely, stuff. he definitely knows what he's talking about. Right. He definitely has a, a, a major positive impact on on people who he's with. I just don't. Maybe it's just a personal thing. I don't like his approach. Okay. But I'll tell you something else. I had a uh, a client, uh, not a client, a student who was doing a, a course with me. She now is one of those superstars you were talking about. Oh, mashallah. right. And on the third or fourth day of our course, she says to me, I don't think I can come tomorrow. I said, why not? She goes, oh, because I've got a, I've, I've booked for Tony Robbins. Because he was also doing an event. 
I said to her, so look, it's, it's your choice. You want to go there? You go there. You want to come here? You come here. It's entirely up to you, but you won't get any refund from me. Mm. <laughs> you might not get one for Tony Robbins either, but you won't get it from me. It's up to you. So anyway, in the end, she decided to come. And that really was the last day of our training. So it's a good that she came. Because when she completed the feedback form, and I've got it to this day, she wrote on there, Tony Robbins versus Abu Yusra. Abu Yusra any day. <laughs> because, yeah. because when they come to my training courses, when they go to my therapy, when they come to my sessions, they go away with something. Not just the, mm. oh, sugar mm. rush. They mm. don't, maybe, they, maybe they'll go Hype. away feeling yeah. a bit unhyped, mm. but it's the impact that over the course of the, the weeks and months yeah. Yeah. that is actually important. Mm. And I, I've seen a couple of interviews of his. And I think that the, the thing with somebody like him is because he's interviewed like on Charlie Rose or yeah. he's on some Forbes magazine or something, yeah. you expect... That's that, right. And I, this is what I've been saying to so many people about, you know, just because some entrepreneur is featured on Time magazine or he's, mm. you know, got the media fame, it doesn't mean actually this guy's, I mean, we're seeing this now. Mm. I won't mention any names, but we've seen entrepreneurs, big famous entrepreneurs yeah. unravel themselves yeah. Yeah. right in the public spotlight. And people are now finally realizing, okay, this person was not what we thought he was because yeah. it's an image that gets created. That's right. And actually you could have some guy next door that could do a much better job of teaching you entrepreneurship or Whatever it is that you want yeah. to learn, yeah. just because that person doesn't have the hype or fame, it doesn't exactly. mean that they don't. Exactly. They can't get you the mileage that you're looking for. But I will say this much: I'm not against Tony Robbins. No, I no, do no, think no, I, I think he he, yeah. he is I'm good with what I, I think he is good at what he does. Yeah, he's just not my style. Yeah, you know, one of the other things that that I've become very much aware of is, um, and unfortunately, I feel that this is happening a lot more in the Muslim world as well. Yeah, that people. Um, begin to follow personalities mm. and it's almost like a celebrity culture yeah right that's when, what i was referring to in this when really it shouldn't be yeah it's you know, cult. what what is what is your purpose mm. your purpose is to serve allah mm. and your goal is to achieve jannah yeah that's it yeah simple as that and if you keep that in mind if you keep on that focus that will let you achieve everything you want to achieve because islam is not against being successful, hmm. Islam is not against being wealthy. Yeah. Islam is not against you know you know having having an impact. Hmm. Islam is not about just being sitting in, in the corner of your house and just worshiping all day long. That's not what Islam is about. Hmm. Islam is about making a difference. Yeah. But the way you make a difference, hmm. if you do it purely for the sake of Allah, the impact will be greater, and your conscious and your your subconscious will feel better for it as well. Hmm. If you don't have that, you will know. Because you'll feel empty at the end of the day. Mm. You know, like you said earlier, when you read the Quran, the Quran asks you a question, you answer it. If you're lying to it, you know. Yeah, yeah. You can't. You can't not you give can't it. Hide it. And, and not, it's that same feeling. Response, yeah. It's that same feeling. At the end of the day, you'll feel empty, mm. and you'll think to yourself, "Well, you know, I had such a fantastic day. So many people, you know, shouting my name and blah blah blah. Why do I feel this way?" But many people don't even ask that question because they're so deep into the into yeah. the cult. Yeah. You know? So yeah, may Allah I mean, protect I, us from I, that. I, I, have a, I have massive. I think the, the this kind of. Uh, this kind of uh, world of cults, this fashion of cults yeah. has become bigger and bigger. People need a sense of belonging. I, somebody sent me a quote of Ibn Khaldun a while back. Uh, I say a while back, a few days ago. Mm -hmm. And it was so eye-opening. And just to paraphrase, because I can't remember all of it. And he says that, you know, when states collapse, you get, uh, you know, poets and flatterers and critics and, and all these things. You get all these people that, that rise to the top of society. And they are... They are people that are, they're basically just hollow people. Mm. They rise to the top of society, and the people that are actually wise, that have something to say, they become alienated, and yeah. they they go to the bottom of society. Nobody yeah. wants to listen to them. Yeah. Their word doesn't travel everywhere, yeah. and the people at the top, theirs is a word that travels. Yeah. And I, I look at it today, and I think, okay, you know what? We we're in a people don't want to admit this or accept this. We are in a state. The society is in a state of collapse. Yeah. These states are collapsing. The UK, the yeah. US, and everything. So you have to understand that if the states are collapsing, that anybody who is famous right now, who has a massive following, mm. you, need to, you need to be able to accept that that person is likely hollow and is just creating an appearance of substance. One of the key things that stood out from that paragraph was um, truth is mixed with falsehood. So you can have somebody that's telling a huge amount of truth, but there's a massive amount of falsehood in there. And we yeah. see that constantly. We, yeah. the, you have people that say really powerful things mm. that have a lot of substance to them, 
But there's also a lack of truth in there yeah, as well. There yeah. is falsehood in there. And that's why there's no barakah in it. There's no barakah in it. But, and, and, and a lot of people, and I, I find men get taken by this, by this more than the women. Mm. They feel the need to belong to this cult. Yeah, yeah. And they feel the need to defend it. Yeah. But you're just part of a cult. Yeah. They can't yeah. see it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so we've, we've, we've spoken all about the, the, the NLP side of things. We've spoken about the, uh, the cults and stuff, right? But when I first met you, um, I was first of all, I was really surprised that you were willing to meet me, given what you've been through. I was surprised you, but you were willing to meet me. I was very, I was very surprised, privileged, and humbled that you were willing to share your struggle with me because that's a privilege in itself. I know a lot of people, you know, they say don't tell other people about your struggles, and I understand that because people can take advantage of your vulnerability and everything. Mm. But for something that was so delicate that you went through, and something that was so difficult that you went through, to want to share that with me and to trust mm. me with that. I want to say thank you for trusting me with that. Um, thank you for listening. No, it, it, <laughs> it's not at all. But, you know, and, and you were in a very different place then. Mm. And I, as I was saying before off camera, and if you don't mind my saying on camera, sure. I, I won't go into too much detail because mm. obviously it's a delicate matter. But you were in a very different position. You were in a very different state. Uh, you know, financially, you had a lot of financial trouble. And uh, there was there was a lot of stress on your face, and you know your body language was different. And today, Alhamdulillah, when I seen you today, you're, you're back to your kind of solid self. Um, you know, you're in a oh, much better state. Allah. And you you were saying to me, so tell me more about. You know, you're saying that that you you feel like that experience is what's made yeah, you what you are yeah. now. You see, um, there there are people who float through life. Yeah. And there's never an issue, minor issues, because nobody's life is perfect. Yeah. And they just go through life and it's all hunky-dory, it's all fine, it's all great. And there are other people who have constant struggles, mm. right? I'm, I'm the constant struggle guy, if I could <laughs> yeah. just put my hand up. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you for that, inshallah. <laughs> because the, the experience you get from that, as long as you take it as an experience and you use it to better yourself, okay. is what's important. Okay. Now I... Okay, do you want to say I'm a chosen one? <laughs> uh, maybe you are, inshallah. Who knows? I'm just kidding. So, so, so the, the, my experience in, in life was that, yeah, there was difficulties and, and whatever, but mm. generally it was a good life, okay. I, I have to admit. Um, would you, know, you say it was kind of a bit of a floating life at yeah, the beginning? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I, I was born in Pakistan. Uh, my mom had been born and brought up in East Africa. Okay. Um, lived all her life there. What part of East Africa? In Kenya, okay. in Nairobi. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then she got married and went to Pakistan. Okay. Um, the culture, the, the weather, the environment just didn't suit her. Okay. I was born there. And when I was about nine months, I think maybe a year old, both she and I got to the stage where the doctors basically said, go back to where you came from. Because really? you're not going to survive. And what part of Pakistan was uh, this? So this is in the Punjab, in, in Faisalabad. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, we went... Well, that's back. Pakistan for you. <laughs> yeah. So I we, can't survive in Pakistan. Yeah. So we, we went back to Pakistan. I was born there, but okay. then, you know, we went okay. over to back, to back to Nairobi to where her, her parents were. You know, my, my nana nani were. Uh, and then a couple of years later, we tried again, and mum had the same problems again, and, okay. you know, back and forth. And anyway, eventually we ended up in this country. Um, alhamdulillah. But because I was born in Pakistan... I didn't have a British passport. Okay. I had a Pakistani passport because my right. dad was Pakistani. Right. My mum, having been born in Nairobi, had a British passport because it was a colony. Oh, really? Yeah. So she had a British passport, but because she was the wife. They don't do that now, though, do they? No, no. <laughs> Not even when you're born here. They, they, only do, they only do that for the Hong Kongers <laughs> yeah. now. Hong Kongers get free yeah. access. So um, I ended up having to go to private school okay. uh, because I wasn't allowed in state school because I didn't have a British passport. No and, way. And, and, you know, you know, lots of other things. And being in private school was financially very difficult for my family because mm. the fees weren't cheap. I can imagine. On top of all of that, because we'd actually come from Africa with my nana nani, they'd basically had to leave everything and come over. Not because anything happened in Kenya, mm. but my grandfather had the vision that if it's happening in Uganda today, it's going to happen in Kenya tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. And he had four daughters and he had a son and he said, right, we're going to go while we can, while the going is good. <laughs> so we basically came here with nothing. And so we were living in rented accommodation, you know, and, and, and I was in a private school and, and had younger siblings who were too small to go to school. And I was a clever student. Hmm. I was a clever guy, alhamdulillah. You're still a clever man. <laughs> I had, uh, you know, the teachers were, 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 you know, when the first day I went into school, I remember my only English was thank you. I spoke no other English apart from that. Wow. You know, and then alhamdulillah, you know, over the time, you know, we grew. And it just so happened perhaps not just happened, it was Allah's will, that for my entire education career, I then stayed in private school. Right, okay. 
But just before my exams, things started happening. You know, issues started mm-hmm. happening. Um, not necessarily to me personally, but within the family. But they affected the, the, like, They affected me. Yeah. So it, it so ended up that I actually didn't do any exams. So I left school without any qualifications. No way. After went, all that schooling. Yeah. So no, no qualifications. Went back, did some um, night school. But by that time, my mind was a bit messed up. And so I only ever got two O-levels. But luckily, mm-hmm. they were in English and maths. Okay. <laughs> so the that, two most that, important ones. Yeah, so that helped. Um, and then, you know, I went to college, but I didn't really like college. The environment wasn't really for yeah. me. It's not for any of us, is Yeah, it? so my, um, my aunt was a civil servant. And um, she got me a holiday job, a summer job. And in that summer job, I got, I got allocated to an office where the last clerical assistant hadn't been in post for about three months. Right. So the office was a complete mess, files all over the place, mm. nothing in order, nothing that a clerical assistant would do. And so there's me, 16-year-old, straight out of school, and I'm landed in this job, and it's a holiday job only. But in that one month, I got that department running like clockwork, right? I got all the How files. How old were you away. at this point? 16. Really? 16, 16 and a half. Wow. Yeah, so I got the department running like clockwork. So when my time came to an end, they didn't want to let go They of said you. to me, stay on. Yeah. So I said, oh, but I've got college. And I really didn't want to go to college. I was actually enjoying being at work. Uh, and they said, you know what? Stay, work, and we'll give you time off to study. Okay. And this is London, is it? This is London, yeah. Okay. This is, yeah, this is London. And so I uh, stayed on. I, I got taken on as a full-time employee. Um, and I started, you know, continuing with my education. Um, I managed to get an A-level out of it. Yeah. You know, an English A-level and, 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 Amazing. and an economics A-level, actually. Amazing. <laughs> but the whole purpose of this narration is that when difficulties come, you either man up to them or you crumble under them, mm. right? And what I had seen from my grandfather, because I was very close to him, he, he brought me up. He spent a, invested a lot of time in me. You know, he used to take me to the masjid so that I would learn Quran. He had to have changed three buses because we didn't have a car. And, you know, he was an old man and it was winter, but he would take those three buses and he would go with me and to be holding my finger. And all the way he'd be telling me, giving me advice. And he was a great student of Alama Iqbal. Mm. So he used to be reciting Iqbal to me mm. and it all went over my head, but he would then translate it into simple Urdu or simple <laughs> Punjabi for me so I could understand. And I was like, what is the point of all of this? But the seeds, but as you spoke about earlier, now, yeah. the seeds had been planted. Mm. And I had also seen how he had struggled for the good. Struggled for me for the good. Struggled mm. for his family for the good. Mm. And so when these difficulties came, I was resilient. Mm. I didn't mind that as a clerical assistant, I was being asked to basically control, make sure the office ran, because without the filing system, mm. office can't run. Mm. And alhamdulillah, they saw so much potential in me that within a year and a half, they promoted me. I became a manager, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So all of those experiences... It says a lot about the education system as well, though. Yeah. yeah. All of those experiences actually fashioned me because I could easily have just said, okay, I don't have the qualifications, I don't yeah. have this. But my, my mindset was, yeah. we're going to work through this mm. and we're going to achieve it. Now, at every step of the way, because I didn't have the qualification, I had to prove myself. Mm. I had to prove myself either on the job, mm. I had to prove myself in interviews, mm. I had to prove myself in applications, mm. and I had to basically work twice as hard to get even part of the recognition that perhaps other people would have got. Yeah. But that's what spurred me. Mm. With a lot of people, perhaps that would have stopped them. Mm. That's what spurred me and I kept going. I kept going to the, to, the, to the extent that I got to a position where I applied for a civil service job in, in the senior civil service. Mm. I went for the interview. At the end of the interview, they took me around. They showed me, this is where you'll be sitting, blah, blah, blah. So what does that say to you? I've got the job, right? Mm. Two weeks later, I hadn't heard anything formally. Mm. So I gave them a call. Mm. And uh, they said, oh, the, the, the head of the um, interview panel is on holiday. Uh, phone back in a, couple of, in, a, in a couple of weeks and, you know, we'll, we'll see you. Mm. Phone back in a couple of weeks and uh, I get to speak with the gentleman. And uh, he said, oh, you, we need to set a time for me to give you some feedback. I was like, oh, my God, feedback. I really must have done really badly. So at the appointed time, I called him and uh, he says to me, where do I start? I thought, oh my God, <laughs> this is really bad. Much worse than I had thought. And I said to him, I said, sir, maybe it's a good job to start with the application. Then let's just start at the beginning. So he went all quiet for a couple of minutes, a lot of rustling of papers and whatever. And then he says to me, it was the best application. Oh, wow. I thought, right. So why are you taking <laughs> me through all this stress? <laughs> yeah. So I said, it must have been the interview then. Yeah. 
He says, actually, it was the best interview. <laughs> he said, you were head and shoulders above the other candidates. Mashallah. And I said, so I don't understand. Best inter- best application, best interview. And I've not got the job. I said, I was even show You showed me around as to where I'd be sitting. He goes, yeah, we had the look and we had a review. And, you know, basically, he goes, Shahid, you don't have enough experience. <laughs> I thought, okay, what type of experience are you looking for? Because I've not got to this position to without be able to apply to this without the experience. Yeah. You don't have enough interdepartmental experience. Right. I said, okay. So anyway, that was a big body blow. Yeah. But again, you pick yourself up, you get yeah. going. And within a few months, another opportunity came for another similar type of job. I that applied for it. me up. And it went the same way. Okay. Best application, okay. best interview, didn't get the job. And that's when I decided, Khurum, there's a glass ceiling here. Right. I could sit and fart, fight, yeah. and I could spend the rest of my life doing that and actually not do anything that I was, mm. you know, mm. was really mm. enthused by. So that's when I decided to leave. Okay. So I left. Uh, for a couple of years, I did, you know, just various stuff, giving back to the community and that kind mm. of stuff. And then I started my own business. Mm. Now, that's a long story that I've given you. Mm. The crux of which is for me simply goes back to one of the teachings of my granddad. And that was that he got, he, he said to me one day, he said, um, he said, go out. We lived on the main road. He said, go out and tell me what you see. So I went out. Cars, buses, bus stop, shops. Came back and told him. He said, go back and look with my eyes. So I went back. Okay. Some greenery. Some, some flowers. Yeah. Came yeah. back and told him that. He said, go back and look with my glasses. <laughs> so I went outside. And I really couldn't see what he was on about. So mm. I said to him, I said, I'm, you know, we called him a budgie. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking for. He said, did you notice that the council planted new trees? I said, yeah, 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 they did. He said, what, what's, he says, what do you see with those trees? And these were little saplings, right? Mm. Little, little weedy old things, mm. right? And uh, next to each one of them, there was a strong six-foot pole that had been planted, and the tree trunk, the little right, sapling, had, yeah. been, had been tied to it. He says, you see, Shahid? He goes, you're that sapling. Your roots are not very strong, mm. Right? He goes, that pole, that's me. He goes, I'm the one that's there to hold you straight. Yeah. He goes, when your roots take hold, then. when you're strong enough to go upright and carry on, he goes, they'll take that pole away. Mm. He goes, and such is the nature of life. By that time, he goes, I'll be gone. Mm. And he goes, but I will have ensured that your roots are strong enough, mm. that you grow upright and strong. Mm. You'll sway with the wind. But this thing is but not society fall over. From, from society now. Yeah. It doesn't exist in society. It doesn't anymore. exist anymore. Yeah. So, so it was this those. Is why we're getting hollow kids. Exactly. Yeah. And it was those teaching, and, and and not only that, but my grandmother, right, who was born a hundred years ago this year. She's no longer with us, of course. Hundred years ago this year, but she was somebody who was apparently uneducated. She came over from India to Nairobi at the age of fifteen or sixteen. You know, never saw her parents again. Mm. She was, you know, she brought up her family. There's lots of struggles. Mm. You know, she actually worked with my grandfather in his construction business, looking after the employees, mm. all of that kind of stuff. And one thing she always used to say, if another human being can do it, mm. then so can I. Mm. And it was those teachings from my grandparents, you know, and, and of course my parents as well, that actually helped to fashion me, that gave me that mm. resilience, that gave me that strength. Mm. So when whatever happened to me in 2014 happened, mm. It was devastating. Mm. That's my best way of describing it. Yeah, I mean, that stuff is just... I lost my career. Mm. I lost my business. Mm. I lost my house. Mm. I was very lucky, very fortunate that, alhamdulillah, my family stood by me. But my at that time, my youngest son, who was nine at the time, came home one day and he looked me in the eye and he said, Abuji, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, sure. He said, Abuji, are you a terrorist? And that took the floor from under my feet. That was the impression that my kids were getting from what was going on outside. And the media onslaught was unbearable, really unbearable. And again, what I could have done was, you know, go away somewhere, go to Pakistan or whatever. Mm. But I decided to stay where I was. And I decided that, you know, whatever's happened hasn't happened to me. Mm. It's happened for me. Mm. Mindset. Yeah, it's happened for me, and I've got to use this now to build myself up again. However, the the whole process—I don't want to go into the detail of it because I don't think you know it's that um, enticing to listen to. But the whole process meant that I ended up in massive, massive debt. Mm. Mm. Um, I had to leave, you know, my home and everything. I had to move back in with parents for a little while. Um, but Alhamdulillah, today 
I'm on the way back up. Mm. And I'm what on would the you way say back. is that the, the, if, you, if you don't mind my yeah. asking, yeah. Uh, not to interject, but like, if you could boil it down, because I've seen the contrast in you. I've seen, I've seen what you were like four or five years ago, because even, even a few years after all this had happened, mm-hmm. you were still reeling the effects of it, yeah. right? Yeah. So it was so damaging. Yes. Uh, and it was so kind of, it stripped you of so much. Mm. And then to see you now, because I haven't seen you for about maybe, what, three years now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Something but there's, like a that, big, yeah. there's a big difference in you now from then to now. Mm. What would you say is like the, 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 the thing that's really been the pivotal aspect of it for you? Well, th- throughout all of this, I've always had self-belief. Okay. Throughout all of this. Mm. Whatever happened, I've always had self-belief. I've always known that, you know, I have the ability, I'm capable, et cetera, mm. et cetera. But mm. what had happened because of external influences. Yes. You did get worn down. I had just... That's exactly. I'd yeah. become worn down. Yeah, I didn't have. It the, grates at you every day. Didn't have it's like a motiv- death by a thousand cuts. Kind exactly. Of thing. I yeah. didn't have the motivation. I. Didn't, how did you get over that? You know. And again, that. How did I get over that? Great question. First of all, it was mindset. Okay. Again, and secondly, and you know, don't don't. I I urge all your your viewers, people who are listening, maybe watching this, not to take this lightly, but if you involve Allah in your life. He looks after you. Mm. Never, ever, ever, whatever you're going through, never abandon Allah. Subhanallah. Yeah. Never believe that He has abandoned you because He won't. Mm. He says that in Surah Taha as well, yeah. doesn't He? He says he Allah has abandon. not abandoned you. Exactly. So that was the first thing, knowing okay. that Allah has my back. Because I haven't done anything wrong. No, absolutely I hope, not. In the eyes yeah. of Allah. And that was right? proven anyway. Yeah. So I knew that Allah had my back. The second thing, again, don't take this lightly, brothers, sisters, whoever's watching. The du'as of your parents mm. They can change your destiny mm. Right And the du'as of my Not just my parents But my elders as well But also mm. your well-wishers yeah, as Well well-wishers Exactly yeah, yeah. So, so friends Now Here's just a, just a slight digression People who I knew well People who knew me well People who I sat Down with every night Every evening Whatever They were the last ones to ever get in touch with me. Yeah, I was literally just about (laughs) to ask you this. I was just about to ask you this because I've known families. I've known families from before I met you where they've had this calamity in their lives. And then the people that they thought were their friends became the vultures or yeah. basically just, just... Just uninterested. Yeah, just ran yeah. away. Yeah. And the people that they thought would not come to their aid or would not be planted with yeah. them, yeah. they're the ones that actually stuck around. Exactly. And I mean, I, I don't want to go into detail because I'm going through you know, a whole host of stuff right now, which, which I, I don't discuss on camera, but I've sure. been telling you. Yeah. I'm going through a whole host of stuff right now. And what's been really interesting to me as well, the, the people that I thought would be there in my support mm. have not been there. Um. And it's been other people that I would have least expected sure. around. And, but also, this 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 entire time has taught me, and I don't mean this in a I don't mean this either in a selfish way or a cynical way or a bitter way. But what this has taught me, you only actually need Allah. You don't actually need anybody. Absolutely. And I don't mean I don't mean that in a Absolutely. in a in a discarding kind of way. Yes. It's just if Allah has got your back. Nothing Nobody can harm Absolutely. you and he can correct the affairs for you yeah. on his own. Yeah. You know, like the situation that I've ended up in, people, you know, people end up in certain situations. You at least always feel like you at least always have the support of your sibling. Yeah. You always, you at least always have the support of your spouse. You at least always have the support of your parent, mm. a parent or both of your parents. And I've ended up in situations over the last few years where for one reason or another, and by no, not, uh, there would be no, uh, uh, um, it's been no lack of interest or intention on their part, mm. but for whatever reason, they have not been able. They have not been able to support me or help me in any way, mm. and so I've literally just had Allah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. nobody else could have done anything yeah. in that situation, yeah. and it's and it, the whole thing is by Allah as well. The whole design of it. Absolutely. So, like, just really quickly, like when the COVID thing happened, and uh, my, my son was being born in hospital, right, and that happened during COVID, and my mum had said, my mum had said to me. Um, the minute your wife goes into labor, because my my mom and dad, my mom especially, but my dad as well, my mom's amazing like this. My mom was like, as soon as as soon as your wife goes into labor, you just call us, whatever time it is, eleven o'clock at night, three in the morning, six in the morning, wherever it is, we'll drop everything, we'll come to the hospital, we'll stand outside in the car park, we'll wait in the car park until your child is born, and we'll be there with you. And my dad was like, you know, because you know, like. 
I, I, you, you know this because you've been yeah. through this. You know, a simple, when your child is yeah. born, when it's your first child, a simple thing like putting a car seat into the car is yeah, very stressful. Exactly. Right. And my dad was like, I'll be there. I'll help you with the car seat and we'll sort this out and we'll, yeah. sort, we'll do all this kind of stuff. And then COVID happened. One person's allowed into the hospital. You can't travel from a different one city to another city. Mm. They, they couldn't come. So despite their intention being there, I'm getting emotional just talking about it. Sure. Despite them wanting to be there, they, they couldn't, couldn't come. Be. My wife's parents, her own parents, they couldn't come because COVID, because COVID exactly. was just, I know. right. And that for me was my worst nightmare. Yeah. I'm in this, and then obviously my wife, she's giving birth, so she can't help herself. Sure. She's the one who's giving birth. So I literally, and then I can't, my son can't help me. He's just being born. <laughs> exactly. All I have is just me and Allah. It yeah. was just, for, for five days, it was just me and him. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I had. Yeah. And nobody, I couldn't speak to him. And then what was really interesting was one friend who was quite a new friend, his support meant everything to me. And all he did was just, why didn't you just come and have dinner at my house for an hour? Why didn't yeah. you just lay down, uh, down down on the floor for an hour? Yeah, yeah. He does exactly. not know how much that meant that, to me. Exactly. That one little thing at that moment. That's right. And then uh, I spoke to a, a friend on the phone. And he just said, he just said one thing to me, because you're doing really well. That's yeah. all I needed. That's it. That's all it. I needed. Just That's say it. one kind thing exactly. in that moment because exactly. you're doing really well. And since then, I, you know, I yeah. just have so much affection for him. Yeah. Because if somebody can say that, if you can recognize that somebody's going yeah, through something, exactly. Exactly. in that moment, you can say to them, yeah. you can just offer one word of yeah. rahmah to them. That's right. And this is exactly what I was saying that, you know, that I, I, have, a, I have a friend. I, I'd never considered him to be a close friend. Okay. Right. He was somebody I knew. Right. Right. From the Muslim. Like an associate or a distant. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and, and when all of this happened, right. I got one phone call from him and he said to me, Shahid bhai, a whole coach is ready to come and support you. Don't worry. Wow. And they, this is from somebody who lives about 120 miles away. Mm. He said, I've got a coach of people. We're ready to come and support you. Don't Sorry, worry. Don't and you know, as you said, yeah. you know, from people that living next door to, to you, people living in the street around yeah. the corner from you yeah. who want to avoid you, want to ignore you. And then you get people like that. Mm. And that gives you hope. But I just want to pick up on something you said yeah. about when you were going through with, with the birth of your baby and whatever. And and you say, and it's just a figure of speech, so it's not yeah. a criticism. Yeah, no, no, no. You you were saying that you know it's just Allah. Yeah, that word just. Yeah, that's yes. Yeah. In that context, yeah. it is only Allah. It's only Allah. Yeah, it is only Allah, and it's He is Allah. more than enough because He created the he entire created world. Everything He yeah. created. Everything. You don't need anybody exactly. else. You don't need anything exactly. Else. Yeah. And you know the you know the 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 the, the famous saying of. I, I don't remember which I think is a, is a I think it's an Amal well, I'm not entirely sure and I don't even the words to it but he said that you know if you have and it's, a, it's an ayat of the Quran as well which is which he reflected on that if you have Allah you need nothing else yeah. and if you don't have Allah even if you have the entire yeah. universe behind yeah. you it's worth nothing in the entire mountain you know? exactly exactly yeah. and that's yeah. that's the power and so when I refer back to you know what I was talking to you earlier about my story what was the one thing it was the belief in Allah mm. the unflinching belief in Allah the du'as of my parents, mm. and then self-belief. Mm. And this is something that Elam Iqbal, El- El- Iqbal does spend a lot of his poetry on, talks about, he talks about khudi, you know, yourself, mm. right? And there's a there's a, 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 a couplet of his that, that I use very much, use very often, again, talk to me about my late granddad. He said, khudi ko kar buland itna, mm. ke har takdeer se pehle, khuda bande se khud puche bata, teri raza kya hai? Yeah. And the translation of that is simply that, you know, you should... Achieve such a level of iman, not of wealth, mm. not of status, mm. but of iman, mm. that when somebody something is written for you, then Allah may consult you because of your level of iman before He makes that happen. Mm. That's, what do you want? What do you want? Yeah, Daily yeah. My business partner always used to say yeah. this, and you know that's that's what's really important, and it's those things, Quran, those things put together, not individually, but those things put together. That what gave me the strength to continue. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, like I said, those people who intended harm, in my heart, forgiven. Really? Forgiven. Not forgotten. Okay. But forgiven. Right? Because they did not affect me. And what about the people that you thought were going to support you and didn't support you? How do you feel forgiven. about those? Okay. That's forgiven. Okay. I, I, if I carry that weight, mm. it's only going to hurt me. Mm. They don't know mm. that that's how I'm feeling. Mm. So why should I carry the feeling? Mm. So I drop the feeling. Mm. And again, these are, you know, these are techniques that we have within NLP that we can help to overcome them. And in that context, NLP has really helped me as well. Mm. Of course, my faith has, my deen has. That's mm. the first thing. 
But those techniques within NLP have really helped me as well because I've done some work on myself. And I've got NLP colleagues to work with me mm. and say, look, I can't do this to myself. Yeah, perspective. So, you know, help uh, me. It's help like me. a barber and, needs somebody yeah, else to cut ex- his hair. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so Alhamdulillah, those are the things I would say, the key things that, that kept me going and, and have allowed me to stand up again and to stand tall. Mm. And, 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 and I hate... That was, actually, that was a term that, if you don't mind my saying it, when, when you got out of the car today, the one thing that I noticed compared to, from now to before mm. is just standing tall now. Alhamdulillah. When I, when I met you last, the, you know, the first time I met you wasn't quite there. Yeah, it was all about over the shoulder, wasn't it? It was all kind of, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of just yeah, looking away. Yeah. And kind of Alhamdulillah. Like, because and it, you kind of, because the, I, I, this, the similar thing happened to me is like there was so much stress that was taking place when my son was born mm. I just walked into a Sainsbury's to get some milk or something and I, I felt like I was going to get shot that somebody's mm. going to get a rifle out and mm. shoot me mm. and I couldn't even go I couldn't even go up yeah. to like the counter yeah. I was just thought oh they're gonna, yeah. I'm going to get shot yeah. because you just because the anxiety makes you feel that way yeah, that's it's like right. a form of PTSD that's right. you know that's right that's right yeah. and again you know uh, you, you know I, I said earlier about the linguistic and the programming side of NLP that you refer back to previous experiences. Yeah. So I had never had an experience that put me in yeah. that position. Yeah. But what I did have, and this is why it's really important for youngsters today to understand the impact and the, the brilliance and the benefit of actually sitting and talking to your elders. Yeah. So my grandfather, my grandmother, my you know elders, they used to sit and tell us yeah. about their hardships. Mm. And when I heard those hardships, and now I'm now in this situation, I had a I had an idea a reference point. of how to behave. Yeah. Rather than just let myself go, mm. I had an idea of how to behave. Mm. And you know, alhamdulillah, like I said, those who intended bad, mm. Allah will deal with them. Mm. I have no malice towards mm. them. I don't wish hell upon them or anything like that. Allah will deal with them. I'm okay. Alhamdulillah. Mm. But it's those things that kept me going. Mm. And I think that's what that's my big, biggest lesson to my own children is build your resilience. Mm. Never be a frightened to, to you know to 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 face up to things <coughs> carrying on from where, when i last saw you because you're a man of many wonders and many experiences i know we talked about like these um you know setting up spiritual retreats i was going to do a spiritual retreat around here somewhere I remember yeah and we were going to do it together we were going to do it together yeah. and, and then yeah. you know and then you gave me that you you helped me kind of uh, get some qualification and all that kind of stuff yeah. and then but there was something interesting and I, I remember you talking to me about the debt as well we had the conversation about yeah. the huge amount of debt mm-hmm. and everything but something else happened at the same time, which was the arrival of your son. Yes. And if if you do, if it's okay for me to yeah, say, yeah, you know, yeah. you 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 started on your fifties, and you had a you had a son yep. who at that time was what six months, I think. Yeah, that's right. And your and your wife is uh, in. If it's okay to say, she's in her forties, right? Yes, mid forties. Right. Yes, at that time. At that time, yes. you know, we're we're being encouraged to have another kid. I'm like, no, thank you, I can't <laughs> do this. So and yeah. I, you know, people say it to me, and mm. I always think, I always remember you. Mm. I, had, I had a doctor say to me a couple of weeks ago, "You're gonna have one." I was like, "Look, I'm 43 now." Mm. She's like, "Yeah, so." Yeah. I was like. Well, you make a point because I have a friend who had a kid. Yeah, <laughs> late on because so, yeah. you've got a big gap between yeah. your. So my eldest at the moment, my eldest is now, mashallah, twenty five. Right. Uh, the the second one is nineteen. Okay. And then I have a six year old. Amazing. You know, alhamdulillah. But you've had a good, really fun time with your six year old. Uh, I tell you, you what, it's actually been amazing. Mm. Now, my my relationship with my first two children when they were younger was really good. Okay. But, but, I missed out. Okay. Because I was just so busy, mm. not only with work, mm. um, not only with my own business, not only with the voluntary volu- voluntary work that I used to do. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I was chairman of uh, of a mosque in London. Yes, that's probably one of the biggest mosques. Was it the second largest mosque? Yes, the Arrow one? yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. And you know, when when I when I got landed as the chairman of that com- community. We were two hundred fifty thousand pound in debt. Mm. We had a crumbling mosque. Mm. We just bought some land, which is also in debt. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, only by the grace of Allah, not my doing, Allah put me in that position. But it, He is the one who guided us. In a period of five years, we got out of debt and built a six million pound mosque. Mm. You know, Alhamdulillah. I thought so it was nine million. It eventually ended okay. up being, but okay. it was six million at that time. Um, then I left, and then things went haywire. Yeah. So. <laughs> I forgot. I'd forgotten we had a conversation about. Yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. The, 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 the point was that I, I missed out on okay. them because I was too busy. Mm. And I really, as they got older, yeah. I regretted that. You noticed the... I gap. regretted that because I, I noticed that they weren't perhaps talking to me. They weren't perhaps engaging with me. Um, they had seen what had happened and that had made them keep their distance because maybe they didn't want to be associated with me. And so when the little one came along, he wasn't planned. It's Allah's mercy and Allah's wish. But both myself and my wife, despite 
our relative old age at that time, we were actually thrilled to be able to have the news that you know Allah was going to bless us and we, we prayed that everything went well and did Alhamdulillah. And when this little man came along, right, I made a commitment to myself that I was going to be completely different with him. Mm. And no matter how busy I was, I was going to spend my time building my relationship with him. And you know that I also run parenting courses. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes when I did those parenting courses, I used to feel a little bit like in an imposter syndrome, right? <laughs> because of how my relationship with the other two is not bad, alhamdulillah, yeah. right? It's not, it's not as if, you know, we're at each other's throats and they don't want to see me or whatever. We live together, but alhamdulillah. There's a certain distance. But there, there's, there's a little bit of a, a gap. And as I said, it's not their fault, it's my doing. Mm. My fault because I was too busy. Mm. My wife warned me about it. Other people warned me about mm. it. But you know, you're too involved mm. to see. Mm. And then when the time is gone, it's gone. Hmm. So I try my you know, best with them now to make it up. But then I, with the little one, I thought, I'm not going to make those same mistakes again. So Khurram, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, when I come home from work and I open the door and I just stand in the door, he hears a door going and he'll come charging out. Da, 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 da. He'll yeah. jump into my, into my, into, into my, you know, goodie, you know. He'll want to have his dinner with me. He'll want to go to bed with me. Amazing. He has his little habit where he pinches the knuckle while he's going to sleep. And he's like, Daddy, I want to pinch you. <laughs> Amazing. You know? So Alhamdulillah, you know, from that perspective, the fact that, you know, we went through what we went through, he was a healing for us. Because mm. he happened, he happened afterwards. Allah rewarded you. He was a healing for us. And not only was he a healing, but he's actually given me, you know, my wife Alhamdulillah has been involved with all the kids throughout. May Allah bless her and grant her all the happiness she deserves. Amen. Amen. But with me, it's almost like having a second chance. Mm. And, I, and this time, what I decided to do was I decided to implement those things I teach in my mm. parenting. Mm. Not that I didn't know about them mm. previously, mm. but I never acted upon them mm. because I thought, this is for other people. Mm. And that was my arrogance, mm. my weakness. Mm. This time I said, okay, now I'm going to actually implement them because they are taken from the sunnah of the Prophet. Mm. So they're only going to be beneficial. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, the relationship what, what, I have give, with this give boy. Give me one thing that you've done now different. Okay, I know obviously you give him more time. Yeah. And you, you know, you've, you, but in terms of the actual time that you're giving, what's one thing that's yeah. different now compared so, to before? So, so you know, there, there's, there's ways, you, the, some people consider that if you just sit with your child, that's giving them time. Okay. But it's not. Okay, so you have to be present. You have to be present. Mm. You have to actually, you know, I, I say this in my parenting sessions, and you know, this may be a little trailer. How do children spell the word love? I don't know. Try. How do they spell love? L O V E? No, L U V probably. No. They spell the word love T I M E. Do they? <laughs> time. Give me time. Because time is your most valuable committed commodity. Mm. Once time's gone, it's never going to come back. So you have to spend it wisely. You have to see where you're going to invest that time. Mm. And so what I've done with the little one is I've not just sat with him. You engage. I've engaged with him. Mm. I read to him. I play with him. Even though I'm 50 and he's five and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And I don't have the energy perhaps to the rough and tumble mm. and whatever. Mm. But, alhamdulillah, I do. But, <laughs> but no, you definitely don't like you know, you. But alhamdulillah, I, I do all of that things. And which is why he engages back with me. Mm. So he gives me back what I give him. Yeah. And that's my biggest lesson. Okay. I perhaps had an expectation that because I'm their dad, the other two will just be with me because I'm mm. their dad. Mm. It doesn't work like that. Mm. They'll give back to you what you give them. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, and I want to say this on camera, I absolutely adore all my three boys. Mm. I love them, all of them to bits. Alhamdulillah. Mm. I have no, they didn't do anything wrong. It was fault, my mm. fault. And I seek their forgiveness for that. Mm. But Alhamdulillah, with the third one, the way things are at the moment, I'm a lot more happy and content. And I hope, inshallah, that that continues. I think, inshallah, the other two will see that this is what our father is capable of. And they'll, they will seek that. And they will, yeah. you know, because you go through your own things. Yeah, you know, like my, my relationship with my dad changed over time. Yes. And then it kind of, you kind of move yeah. away and you step yeah. into your own thing and yeah. you kind of come back as well. Yeah. Those things happen yeah. as well. I mean, talk about relationship with father. My father passed away two years ago. Yeah. Monday, two years ago. Ooh, right. Monday. This coming Monday. Mm. Two, two, and it's what, uh, Friday today? Yeah. So in three days time, you know, it will be two years anniversary since he passed away. And I, I had a good relationship with my mm. dad. I can't say that we were best of friends. Right. And that was a lot to do with cultural difference. Mm. He was born and brought up in Pakistan. I was yeah. born and brought up Formality here. of you know, relationship you know, and all these Formality things. of relationship, yeah. all of those kind of things. And, and so we, we had we had a good relationship, but we weren't, you know, perhaps, and, and of course it's a regret because he's gone now. We perhaps you know, did, couldn't do what we could have done. But I'm so grateful to Allah that my life went the way it did and that I work for myself and I run my own business that in his last few days and weeks, 
I was able to work from his home. Mm. So I was there you for him. I him. was there with him. Mm. My other siblings were there as well. I don't take anything away from them. We were all there for him. Mm. But me particularly could spend the day with him because mm. I, all I needed was a laptop. Yeah. So I could sit in his house and every time he called, you could get up and every go. time, whether it's every five minutes, whether it's every half an hour, yeah, I was able to go, go there. Yeah. Now, that you know, is a great source of strength for me. And but what makes it really beneficial, what makes, it, what makes me even emotional now, Khurram, is a few days before he died, he was very restless. Mm. And he kept on calling, he kept on calling, and I would go to him every, every few minutes. And he was upstairs and I was downstairs. And one of the last times that he called on that day, I went up and I attended to him and I did what I needed to do. And he turned around to me and he said, mm-hmm. And those words will stay mm-hmm. with me forever. Yeah. Because Allah gave me that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Confirmed. When I look at my younger sister and my younger brother, they, they almost, you know, sister lives at home and my brother lives a few doors away. The amount of time they gave my dad. So what he must have thought about them. I mean, because my brother lives just a few doors away, if my dad needed to be attended to at night, my brother would come. Two o'clock in the morning because he lives wow. a few doors away. Wow. He would come. We didn't have that opportunity. And I, mm. and I think, you know, maybe I could have just stayed with my dad overnight and whatever. But, you know, mm. life is life. Mm. So I, I just think about the blessings that they've got for themselves. <laughs> and I'm jealous of them for that. Yeah. yeah. You know, for those yeah. blessings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, f- the fact that for me, my dad said those words to me, meant that he appreciated yeah. and not that I was doing him a favor because it's my duty mm. it was my fault but a person speaks from more purity at that yes time as well, that's so right that's right and those words like I said will stay with me um, and, and you know th- that's taught me another thing we now have in our family an aging elderly population mm. in our family mm. we have a we have that in society five six seven people who are over 70 in our okay. family close family mm. and the way I look at them and the way I deal with them reminds me of of my dad mm. you know that tomorrow they're not going to be here mm. right so why why do something that might cause them distress mm. even it might put me out it might upset my wife because i don't spend enough time with her right yeah, now yeah, yeah. right but it's important for me to do that and this is this is again another lesson that i would like to share with younger people that you know elders sometimes because of their age because of the situation, they can sometimes get a bit tetchy. They can sometimes be a bit, you know, they come down here like a ton of bricks for no reason. Um, they can almost be unreasonable. But the best thing you can do, put up with it. Mm-hmm. Best thing, put up and, and help them. And do, you know, what, the, what they need from you. Mm. Of course, you've got to live your life as well. You can't ignore everything else. But do for them what you can do for them. Because, you know, tomorrow... We've all around. got to go. Mm. They're not going to be around. You're going to say, if only. And that if only, that's the worst feeling in the world. I, I have an aunt who has been a full-time carer for my grandma for the last eight or nine years. Yeah. Just imagine that blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Just imagine that blessing. Absol- I saw my, so, so my grandfather, because um, he passed away when I was quite young. And he and I had quite a formal relationship. But his brother... I used to call him grandfather because I got to know him better. Sure. I ended up having more, spending more time with him. Mm. And I saw him in his last days. And one of the privileges that I got was everybody saw him uh, just maybe the night before he passed away. Uh, I, got to him, I got to see him two or three days before. And I got to spend a lot more time with him. And, you know, I walked in and he was just smile, just yeah. smiling at me. Yeah. And he said, make sure you eat before you go. And I thought, okay, I'm one of his cherished ones. If yeah. you're saying that to me and yeah. you're looking at me this Absolutely. way. Absolutely. And he, I held his hand and he held my hand. Mm. I remember you, yeah. you know, and held yeah. it like this. Yeah. And I thought. Absolutely. You know, I still Absolutely. remember that even Absolutely. to this day, you know, because people don't do that. with Those you. are the memories that stay with you. Yeah. Uh, you know, when my, when my nanny passed away, may Allah ta'ala grant her jannah, she was actually in my arms. Subhanallah. She was in my arms. But, you know, she just, she was in a really bad way. She'd open her eyes. She'd asked for a cup of tea. So my mom bought the tea. My uncle was feeding her the tea and I was supporting her from the back and she passed away in that oh, situation. And again, the fact that, you know, I was there for her will stay with me forever. Not in a bad way. Yeah. Not in a bad way. But the fact that, you know, I was there you can to carry support that. her, yeah. I can carry that with me. And yeah. I hope, I hope that, you know, when I share these stories, uh, especially with my own children, 
they will remember that perhaps when it's my time, when it's their yeah. mum's time, you know, yeah. because yeah. that's what is really important. That's, that's you know, you don't remember, <coughs> you don't remember the bank balance, you don't remember, the, no. you don't remember the fancy cars and the money no. and, the, and the fancy clothes, it's but so you remember temporal. these memories. Yeah, yeah, that's what, what I mean. Remember. I know um, my wife's uncle when he passed away. As soon as we got married, he got a cancer diagnosis very, very early on, and he's not a direct. Uh, he's not like a, an immediate uh, uncle to her mm-hmm. but obviously he's an uncle he's a cousin sure so we went up to see him and I remember it was, it was a group of us sat in the hospital and she was the only one that was actually saying uh, my wife was saying very assuring things to him but she also said to him she said look if I've done anything wrong by you then please forgive me yeah yeah. and he just looked at her and he goes you've not done anything wrong by with by me you're my daughter yeah and he just gave her a hug and that was a very very special moment absolutely very special moment because yeah. i thought you know she's done right by him yeah if i've done anything wrong and then he confirmed there and then you haven't yeah. done anything wrong yeah. by me and it's clean you know and then he, pa- he passed away like literally a few days later he passed away yeah. right in front of my eyes yeah. yeah he took his last breath right in front of me it was very it was very traumatizing yeah. to see that sure so we, we've spoken about cults we've spoken about belonging we've spoken about hardship We've spoken about NLP and all this, but there's a conversation that 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 you and I have been having before as well, and it's this thing about. I mean, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult to know how to frame this conversation, even, hmm. um, because you've said this to me, and you and I have both been having this conversation that anything that is deep and profound in terms of a thought or in terms of a conversation generally is not is not really circulating the way that you you would think that people would yeah. anything that's deep and profound that's life changing you'd think that people would hold on to that and say this is this is something that i need in my life mm. but what we find in society at the moment is the stuff that is the the stuff that is very is of very little substance you know and and so we've been having this conversation about like um uh you know anything that's deep and uh the the content that is actually very superficial mm. and is very light and very hollow yeah. it is passed on as being very deep and very profound yeah. and we're now living in this society that is actually very is is almost inverse of what it should be and yeah. doesn't actually obey the laws of of what of natural laws anymore yeah. and i find the economy to be the same as well mm. and i uh, this going back to this passage by ibn khaldun that somebody was sharing the other day mm. you know the things that he was saying in, in that passage i'll try and share it in the description on this but the things he was saying in that passage, it was almost as if, does he have some crystal ball or does he have some, does he have some un, unseen, unworldly knowledge that he's supposed to be able to say, say these things? Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about it and I thought to myself, it's not that. It's, it's not that his level is so, his level is high. Of course, yes. It's that our level is so, so low. low. That's yeah, right. th- that's why we struggle because he could have been saying those things to his people around him. Mm. They probably would have been able to. They probably would have been able to accept that quite readily. Yeah. But for us, that is very like, oh, yeah, you know, that's such a yeah. such a it's such a big thing for sure, us. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but yeah, this is this is this is an issue. Yeah, it's it's and it's not just an issue in today's day and age. It has, actually has been around a long time. Okay, but we see it more now because I think there's more. Um, awareness around it from the people from people like perhaps us and i'll give you an example <laughs> you know I, I keep on going back to my my late grandfather mm. allah bless him and grant him jannah Amen. he there's one thing he used to say to his kids so my uncles and aunts my parents mm. he used to when, when he used to have a discussion with them if they didn't quite understand his point of view he was quite forceful but he never imposed his view okay right so he he, he was he, firm uh, on it he was yeah he was firm on it and he used to say in urdu punjabi <laughs> you need another 40 years to understand what I'm saying. Yeah. He's been dead 38 years mm. now. Right? And people are starting to understand. And now when we think back, we say, wow, was he ahead of his time? And yes, he was ahead of his time. But the fact is that we didn't have the capacity then. Mm. And one of the things that we need to look at in terms of as, a, as, as individuals, in our nuclear families, and then wider than that towards the community, is actually to build that capacity. Mm. Because it's that capacity that will turn you into a leader. Yeah. And as a community, our birthright is to be the leader of the nation. Yeah, but I, but this the, the thing is that this, the society that we're in right now, 
this is all upside down. Absolutely. The education Absolutely. system is is, yeah. is not building that capacity. The families are broken. Yeah. Right. Households are broken. Yeah. And then because of this increase in living costs and everything, this the, the parents are, you know, like you say, the parents are so busy working. My wife's busy working. I'm busy yeah. working. Yeah. You can't spend the time with the child. You can't create the grounding in the child that That's the child right. needs. That's right. And then there's so many other distractions yeah. and then whatever's going on in the world. Yeah. And the the so it's creating a group of people that don't have the capacity to absorb what is being said. Yeah, yeah. You know? Absolutely right. And and, and I agree with 100% of what you said. Yeah. But what we've got to do is if we are true leaders mm. or we aspire to true mm. leadership, we need to take a step back, right? Because when you're in the middle of something, mm. you don't observe everything that's going on. Mm. So you need to take a step back, you float up, and then you look down at the situation. And that mm. will then give you an alternative vision, an alternative view. What, one thing that I've noticed, right, um is the the thing on like if you look at social media for example on instagram to and not to pick on anybody but you find that the videos that do really really well on instagram is usually a woman doing a dance of some sort mm. some music um and and that kind of stuff or there's some really funny joke and these people have half a million followers or a million followers sure. or five million followers right and you, you could think to yourself okay this is the state of the superficial society that we live in yeah and so this is this is this is a reflection of the culture that we live in yeah but actually there's another way that you could look at it and you could say the reason why those videos are popular is because somebody's getting up in the morning a child or a youngster is getting up in the morning the, the, for example for argument's sake the father's not around so he's got anxiety he's, he doesn't feel uh, he doesn't feel he's got the grounding that he needs he's going into school things are very tough in school now with all these political agendas and with all these different ideas and thoughts and things right um and then he's coming home and his mom's not there because she's busy working and then the mom's coming home and she's she's stressed because she's got a lot on her mind so she's not spending time with him mm. and for that kid he just needs something that can entertain him yeah or the mother might need it yeah so naturally you you're not you, you haven't got the spare energy or the spare attention to have a conversation about how we're going to change the world because you're so busy just yeah. trying to survive. Yeah. Yeah. You're so busy just trying to keep your head above water yeah. that something, some entertaining content yes. is actually, uh, is air and oxygen for you mm. as compared to content that is very deep and very profound. Yeah, yeah. Khurub, I don't disagree with what you said, but I have an issue with it. Yeah, no, that's okay. fine. Yeah. And, and that issue yeah. is simply this, that when you when you look at the, the picture that you painted, yeah. right, of somebody tired, mm. somebody getting up in the morning, not having a father around, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Mm. Exactly like you mm. said, when they come home in the evening, mm. when the mother comes mm. home, when the son mm. comes home, and they're on their phones or they're on their tablets mm. or they're on the TV, what's the one thing they're all utilizing? Time. Mm. So they do have the time. Yeah, it's how but they choose to spend it. But it's an energy thing, they're, isn't it? But if they were just, for example, just as if they were just to put the phone away, just to put the, and just sit and talk to each other. Yeah. I don't yeah. know why that's not happening. That, that's that's what's you know. I, I'm, this to my my biggest gripe, and I think I must have said this to you before mm. as well. My biggest gripe when I was in London was, and this was especially true of men. Mm. I, I didn't notice this in women as much, but I definitely noticed this in in, in the men. You could get into, you could you could be at a group in a group of men, mm. right? You're at some barbecue, some halal barbecue. They're doing burgers, all this kind of stuff, and they get a group of guys that sit together. They don't talk. Yeah. They'd rather share the picture of their barbecue with a friend 100 miles away. Yeah, they'd rather, <laughs> yeah, they would rather take yeah. a picture, yeah. take a selfie yeah. and make it look like exactly. I'm having a great time, yes. but actually not having a great time. Yeah. Or if they, do want, if they do want to talk, they only talk about very safe topics, cars, yeah. work, yeah. football. Football, <laughs> yeah, football. If, and the reason why football is such a massive gripe of yeah. mine is because of all the things that you could talk about, you choose to talk about something that's so basic and you choose to let it rule your emotions. Yeah, that's right. You choose that's to right. let it take charge of you yeah. when there's so many more important things to be talking yeah. about in the yeah. world. Don't want to have, don't have a talk, you don't want to have a conversation about anything yeah, that absolutely. is of substance. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I, I personally feel that one of the reasons we go down that route and, and unfortunately we're all a victim of it to some extent uh, is the fact that we live in a society which now values instant gratification. Yeah. So I want something and I want it now. And if I yeah. can't have it now, I'm going to go look elsewhere. And I'm I don't want to have to it. think. I don't want to have to think. Yeah. And when you even just sit and talk, yeah. you're you having have to, to think. think. Yeah. That's why TV is so popular. That's why videos on mobile yeah. devices this, are so that's popular. That's what I'm saying. Because yeah. they don't allow you to think. They don't yeah. let you think. You don't yeah. have to think. No, you don't have to think. You know? And so when you put out, when you put out content yeah. that makes people think, yeah. it actually puts them off. Yeah. So, so when we were younger, I don't know about you, you're younger than me, but when I was younger, 
and we had to enter, we had to go outside and we had to play football, we yeah. had to climb trees, we had to yeah. ride bikes, mm. play cricket, right? Mm. So we learned how to do those sports. Mm. Today, you don't have to kids will play that. cricket on the mobile phone. Mm. How is that going to teach you how to you play don't, cricket? You don't learn how to make friends. Exactly. You don't learn how to have a conversation. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about and, this uh, as well. Like when I, when I used to, to want to speak to my friends, it, when they're at home, you have to you have to you have to remember their phone number. You dial the phone number. You have to speak to their parent. Hello, Mrs. So and So, Mrs. Smith. Yeah. Is is Andrew at home? Can yeah. I speak to Andrew, please? Yeah. What do you want to talk to him about? Yeah. You know, you had this, this right. whole decorum. That's now right. the kids text each other. Yeah. So they don't they don't know how to speak to an elder because That's they don't right. have to go through it, and That's it was right. very daunting. So yeah. now they can't have they can't yeah. have a conversation I, on the phone. I, I, I remember a funny story. Um, I used to, I used to teach in schools as a consultant, so not as a teacher, okay. but as a teaching consultant. Okay. And I was in this class, and um, the, 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 we had we had the form teacher there, and she was telling the kids, you know, put your phones away, this, that, and the other. And there was one boy who was actually on the phone under his desk. Mm. So, so she said to him, "Look, if you don't put it away, I'm going to take it away from you." So next couple of minutes later, he's standing there with his hand in his pocket. So she says to him, whatever his name was, "What are you doing?" He says, "I'm texting my friend." <laughs> he was so adept. It was one of those yeah. old phones. With so he could do it from the thing. Yeah. So he could actually feel the button. He could text his friend from from the buttons. Okay. So adept at doing it. Mm. But that same kid, when I was teaching him, had difficulty understanding one of the most simplest concepts of spelling. Mm. So what's he texting? I probably couldn't have a conversation with his yeah. friend. So what's he texting? Yeah. How, how what is he spelling? How is he spelling those words? Yeah. All slang. Mm. Yeah. So it's shortcuts yeah. to get to where you need to get to. Mm. And that's why that's what's there's a lack of profundity. Down. Yeah. That's yeah. that's what's that's missing. what's letting us yeah. down. Yeah, and, and and you know, unfortunately, we use any number of excuses as adults, as elders, as parents, any number of excuses. Just let the kids get away with it because we're too lazy and tired to do something about yeah. it. it. The thing you is, know? and, and the as life I say, has become exhausting. It, it has, yeah. Yeah. undoubtedly. Yeah. But Khurum, you know as well as I do, if you want to achieve anything in life, you've got to put yourself out there. Mm. No pain, no gain. It mm. stands true. Hundred mm. years ago, it stands true today, mm. right? If if you look at, for example, the society that <coughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mm. was in, granted he was a prophet of God, and you know mm. he would he would have had that benefit, yeah. and we don't. Mm. But the, but look at the society he was in, and look at all the things he had to go through mm. to change it. Mm. And then when the change happened, when the click with people, mm. how quick that change was by the grace of Allah. If we want to do something in our society today, it's not going to be that quick and it's not going to be that easy. But it's got to start somewhere. We yeah. can't keep on putting it off to the next person. Mm. I can't put it off to you. You can't put it off to me, and I can't put it off to X, Y, or Z. Yeah. We all have to make our own mm. start. And as as what I was going to say was. That there's a saying that I, I, I read many years ago, and it's, it's it's quite a popular saying, but they say that, you know, if you want to change the world... you change yourself. You're going to change your country. Mm. If you want to change your country, mm. you have to change your neighborhood. Mm. If you want to change your neighborhood, you have to change your family. Mm. If you want to change your family, change yourself. you have to change yourself. Yeah, That's where it starts. We, 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 we don't live in a society where people, people can take themselves through self-change. That's right. They can't do that. That's we right. don't live in that society. And that's, that's right. not to criticize anybody. Yeah. That's not to, 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 to bring the hammer down on anyone. Yeah. But people have lost the art of how to take themselves through, uh, how to navigate. You know, like, the what, what's going on right now, like, um, I keep saying this over and over, but the there are things that have happened. There are deals that have been made between countries, between nations, between states. There are things that have happened in the last six months that haven't happened in a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And we haven't we haven't seen the outcome of this yet. We're about to witness this in the next maybe two to five years. And the world would the world will mm, suddenly change, change, change. Right. There'll be a shift of power. There will be a shift of culture. There will be a shift of economies. A lot of things will change in the next probably two to five years. Uh, timing's not my forte, so I don't sure. know when it's going to happen, but it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. And during that change, there's going to be a lot of hardship. It's it's, it's what some people refer to as an uh, as an interregnum. Mm. So an interregnum is where like when you have the change between the old god and the new, new god, god, and then there's a gap in between. Yeah. And that gap in between, there's, there's nobody's in charge and nobody's in power. Yeah. And that interregnum is on its way, mm. right? We, we might be at the beginning of that already. Yeah. yeah. And in that interregnum, we have we you know we have grown up as a society. We're very dependent on the state. Yeah. The state tells us what to do. The council tells us what to do. The TV tell the news tells us what to do. The doctor tells us what to what do. What to believe? You want to believe? Yeah. yeah. The school tells us what to believe. We're told how to run our lives. We can get to 40, 50, 60. We are still told what we need to be thinking, what we need to be believing, and how we need yeah. to be operating. Yeah. But there's a very good chance that we're going to come to a point very soon 
where those people or those, thing, those things will not be available to yeah. tell us yeah. how to think and what to do. And my worry is that when we get to that point, these people who cannot, cannot uh, go through this process of self-change, yeah. they're going to be very lost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. You know, there's, there's, there, are, there are people that I know, families that I know, and I look at them and I think, really, you must do something to get yourself out of this situation. I'll give you one just small example. You know, death. It's hard for everybody to deal yeah. with, for anybody to deal yeah. with, right? Yeah. I've been through, you know, my father passed mm. away, my relatives passing mm. away, etc. But there's somebody that I know who lost a, lost a close relative, a loved one. Five, no, maybe ten years, ten years down the line, they have yet to go and visit the grave. Not mm. that it's fuzz to do that. Yeah, but they can't bring themselves to do it. No. Mm. And you think, Really? And we are told, the Prophet told us, visit the graveyard often for it reminds you of your death. Mm. So by not going to the grave, what are you avoiding? Mm. Yeah. So what we do is, we in NLP there's a terminology called toward mm. and away from. Mm. We are busy living and away from life. Mm. We're running away from yeah, things. Yeah, that's definitely happening. We're running away from things. We yeah. need to actually be man enough, woman enough to face up to things, to have the commitment to, to make that change and then have the commitment to see through that change. Yeah. Or, or to see that change through, rather. Yeah, I'm, you, you know? know, the thing is, my, my worry is that we're going we're to... My, my worry is that we're, we're getting to a point where it's going to be too late. It's like if you haven't learned how to swim and then you get thrown into the river, yeah. you're it's dead. too late. Right, because you, you're literally dead. And also, the, what takes over is the panic. You might have yeah. the physical capability, yeah. but what takes you is the panic. Yeah. And what, I, what I'm trying to get out there, what I'm trying to share with people, everything, you know, whether I'm doing monologues, where I'm, do, do, where I'm having these conversations. Because mm. people say to me, and no disrespect to you in any way, why do you get somebody really famous on, you know, mm. get some big... Mm. I'm like, you know what? We need, to, we need to have conversations with people where the stories haven't been told because these people have depth and insight. Yeah. That's what I want to bring to the fore. Yeah. What are the yeah, stories that haven't been told? I'm trying this. to bring that to the fore, exactly. right? Because these are the stories that are going to help you personally tomorrow. Yeah. Because some massive influencer, some guy who's driving, for argument's sake, some guy who's driving a Bugatti, you actually, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not going to be able to relate to what he's no, talking that's about. that's right. Tomorrow... And, and when they appear on your podcast, yeah. they're going to be doing self-promotion. Yeah. They're not really going to be helping your audience. No, it's all about you know? them. So yeah, and that and that knowledge that you think is benefiting you right now, actually, what it's doing is just entertaining you. Yeah, exactly. And when it comes to real, you know, we all, we're always taught to make the dua beneficial knowledge. Yes. What knowledge is actually beneficial? Yeah. What stuff can actually change your life? Exactly. And a really good a really good test of it is how much can you change somebody else's life? Yeah. That means you've got beneficial knowledge. If you can if you That's can right. uh, transform somebody's life in any yeah. way, yeah. you can say a kind word to them, like your yeah. friend said to you. Yeah. Or you can say something to them that helps them kickstart. Right. That you know, the, this is—it's a beautiful thing that you've just said. Uh, there's a hadith of the Prophet, which is exactly that. Yeah. Khairun nasi ma yanfa'un nas, mm. which means the best of you mm. is he or she who brings benefit to, to others. other people. Yeah. And that is a yeah. strapline for my business. Yeah, it does. You've got to have that. You ha you have to be in a position. My my thing with this right now is. What are the stories that people ha that have not been told that is be of benefit to people? Because it's not about how famous you are. That's it's not right. about how entertaining what you what yeah, it is that you're yeah, going to say. Yeah. Can this benefit you? Yeah. And, and alhamdulillah, yeah. you know, today what has been said. Yeah. Is yeah. And I think just to remind ourselves and to remind myself before we get carried away with ourselves yeah. is that any benefit that we are able to bring is actually the blessings of Allah. Yeah. It's not us. It's not from right? us. No. There's again, if I may, just quote the Urdu couplet. You know. That if you are true to the spirit and the and the teachings of the Prophet, وسلم, then what is this creation? Mm. The tablet and the pen are yours. Mm. Meaning you can write your own destiny mm. because that's what Allah would allow you to do mm. if you are true mm. to the Prophet, mm. if you're true to the spirit of to, Islam. To, to spirit. And I and I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you success in what you're trying Ameen. to do, in Ameen. what you're trying to achieve. Thank and Allah Ta'ala blesses all of us to actually work to have that profundity and within us and to help us to make the change that will eventually be a sadaqah jariya for us. Inshallah. That's that's what I'm aiming for. Well thank you, sir. Thank you for coming in. It's a perfect My note to end that on. My pleasure. It's been a pleasure to have you. The audience doesn't know that you traveled three hours for this. Thank you so much for your <laughs> no effort worries. and commitment. No worries, inshallah. And you've got a three-hour trek back, but yeah. thank you so much. And this is a, a probably a world first to have you on because you are the master yip of the NLP. <laughs> You're the superstar creator. Alhamdulillah. So it's, Alhamdulillah. A, it's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, I like and, it. And thank May you so Allah much for you coming. Too.